Well, today we're gonna to talk about some of the things to consider if making this crucial planning step when building your custom residence of putting a basement within your home. Let's get to it. Due to the overwhelming interest in basements as seen in our previous videos that talk about why basements are rare here in Arizona, which you can go take a look at in which we released just a few months ago. Today, I wanna to talk about some of the complexities of basements and what you should expect as far as timeframes when it comes to something that you're building in the ground. So by far, one of our highest performing videos was why basements are so rare in Arizona, which prompted us to talk about one of the key areas that we covered in the previous video, which you could go take a look, which is the complexities and time that you should associate to the decision of making a basement. Obviously there's the money component, as well as the historical context of why basements weren't built here due to hard dig conditions, as well as the expansive nature of the city of Phoenix and the surrounding cities thereof. We have a fair amount of land to develop, and so you know, there's not a lot of reasons to go down in past generations. However, today, we're gonna be covering the time. And the first thing I wanna talk about is the excavation. Now, obviously in some areas, it's gonna be a lot harder to dig in Arizona, especially if you're gonna be hillside or mountainside um, in some of our areas, whether that be in Scottsdale or Phoenix here with Camelback Mountain. And on this lot, we had perfect dig conditions, but it still took us about two weeks to be able to excavate. And some people might wonder why exactly it takes so long. Well, not only do we have to dig the hole, make sure that it's properly tested by our geotechnical engineer to make sure that it's stable so that we can avoid shoring and other costs that would go into the excavation. But we also have to find a place to put it. And in this case, we actually have a large enough property to be able to keep it on site. But it's not just the excavation, but it's the organization and preparation that goes in to making sure that we keep that dirt on site for our backfill, for any backfill conditions that might arise at the completion of the basement. So the second stage of our basement is that we're gonna excavate all the way to the bottom of the footing to ensure that we get proper waterproofing on our basement. So not only is this gonna create a deeper hole, which was one of the biggest comments we had on why it's so rare to build a basement. But ultimately, um, in this case, we have a combination of 12 and 16 inch footings. And then this is gonna be an 18 inch footing here. And the first step is gonna be for us to get all our rebar in place, which is obviously encased within this concrete footing. But after our rebar, we have to actually set all of our forms which normally we wouldn't have to do here in Arizona on slab on grade. We would dig a 16 inch footing and ultimately we would pour directly into the earth. So now we have to actually do all of our rebar details, which are, which are quite a bit more extensive as seen here. But then we have to come in and we have to actually place forms as if we were setting stem wall or our basement walls, which obviously you can see here, our basement walls are, are being formed or at least formed ready for inspection here soon. So we have the additional complexities of that time frame, which is normally going to be about one week for rebar placement and then another week for forming and uh, placing of that concrete. So now we start moving up to the basement wall detail. Well, in between these form boards, we have a pretty extensive grid system of rebar that consists in this case of number seven, number five, and number four rebar. And based on the cantilevered wall, which is gonna to be to the open outdoor space, or the restrained wall, which is gonna be what we're gonna be framing over, uh, which would be more of a standard basement detail, we're gonna have a lot more rebar to deal with. And typically a good rebar company is gonna be a week, maybe two weeks, depending on how large the basement is. In this case, the details are pretty extensive. And so we had about two weeks, uh, a little less than two weeks for our rebar details. And once those were done, we had them inspected by a third party company because our municipality wanted us to take care of that and take that responsibility off the municipality. And so we had to have a third party inspection that we paid for to come in, um, which kind of stopped obviously construction for about a day while we waited for that inspection before we can actually cover it up with our form boards. Now, there's two different methodologies for forms. Uh, there's probably a few more, but at the end of the day, we have our standard form boards that we decided to go with, uh, which is, relatively common in residential building. There are some concrete companies that uh, will swear by aluminum forms. Um, they're a little lighter weight. They're maybe a little easier to handle. But at the end of the day, um, those are the two most common residential methodologies. And so we're stacking form boards on top of form boards on top of form boards to be able to get, in this case, to our about 12 foot nine, 12 foot three height for our basement walls. And a lot of people might think like, wow, that's a really deep basement. However, if we're going nine foot top plate in the basement, plus two feet of trusses here in Arizona on slab on grade, that's at least 11 feet. But in addition to that, we have some landscaping features on here. 
and we need soil in the walkout portion of the basement and be able to actually do that we had to increase the depth by about 18 inches so that we can actually put plants down there um, and, and a tree that's going to go in in place as well um, that really help with that indoor outdoor living that we get to enjoy here in arizona but ultimately we have another week to two weeks of placing forms prior to us being able to call for city inspection in which they will finalize us and get us ready so that we could place our concrete for all of our basement walls. But overall, this is about a two to three week and it could take longer depending on the complexities of the rebar details that are associated with your basement. So before I move on with the next stages of our basement build, I wanna talk about some of the complexities that are required to think about prior to placing your concrete. And in this case, we have a sump detail for our drainage sump that's gonna be outside, as well as a sewage sump that we'll get to later. But one of the things that we wanna talk about is instead of having to core the concrete, if we can get our conduit in place first, it'll allow us to be able to get the necessary drainage that we need from this sump assembly, this drainage sump assembly, as well as a few other areas that we had to take into consideration for the four inch drainage pipes that are gonna be surrounding the exterior of the perimeter of this basement foundation to ensure for proper waterproofing um, is handled within the overall basement assembly. So we went ahead and we cut some, some conduit pipe that's two sizes bigger than the four inch rigid pipe that actually has to come through these walls to be able to get to our drainage sump so that we can be able to make sure that the water is being pumped appropriately out of here during, in this case, a monsoon storm. But in some of the wetter climates, it's 100% imperative that you're able to figure out some of these details ahead of time, especially if you have areas where it snows or where there's a ton of moisture content. Think Seattle, up in the mountains, like in Park City, um, as well as maybe Minnesota and some of the other areas where basements are common. Some of these details have to be thought through very thoroughly at the beginning of the project prior to placing concrete. In addition to these two conduits, we have two on the far side that help to be able to bring in our sprinkler lines for the landscaping that's going to be going in this exterior indoor outdoor living situation that we have for our walkout patio as well as low voltage we want to keep those in two separate areas obviously we don't want to mix uh, any electrical whether it be low voltage or not um, with any of the sprinkler plumbing that we have that's going to be coming down into the basement the other thing that we want to take into consideration are some of the electrical conduits that are going to be necessary should you have to mount anything to the exterior of your basement wall and we have an exterior patio covered patio space here and we have a TV placement, so we had to measure over and get our electrical conduit in place within basement wall cavity ahead of time to ensure that we can be able to get a great entertainment space out here for our client. And for the last piece of pertinent information I wanna cover is the coordination with your framing team for any bolts and hangers that are gonna be required for your truss or floor joist assembly. And in this case, we like to say we have a covered patio that extends the exterior portion of this basement. And so we have a bolt pattern for five eighths inch bolts that have to be embedded six inches into the concrete. They have to be placed perfectly in line with what eventually will become a ledger that all of our trusses uh, will be basically attached to, allowing for us to be able to have our living room upstairs and a covered patio downstairs on the exterior of this amazing outdoor basement area. Overall, as you can see, there's a fair amount of coordination pieces between your drainage company, your electrical company, and the structural components that are required for framing that are very important to make sure are buttoned up prior to placing that concrete because then you're having to retroactively come back in and figure out a different structural solution for some of these things or additional costs associated with coring concrete, which isn't the cheapest option when you can be able to take care of all those things prior if you just put a little thought and energy into figuring out the nuances of what you're trying to do to live your best life in your basement. So for most people that are looking at doing a standard basement, they might not have a walkout. And so for this portion, I wanna talk a little bit more about the complexities of having the walkout portion of the basement, which in this case is about 1200 square feet of patio space, some covered, some uncovered, which is really gonna make it feel like you have an indoor outdoor concept and it's not just a hole in the ground or a true basement. It's gonna feel like it's meant to be part of the house. What I mean by the complexities of this is that once we strip forms, we're actually gonna have to place some additional forms that abut our exterior basement walls for our interior stem that brings us up to our finished floor height. 
that will allow us to be able to complete our slab assembly and get us to the intended architectural height to ensure that we have our nine foot top plates that'll be framed on top of our finished slab. So once again, this process is gonna take probably another week to be able to get our form boards in place and then get inspection so that we can then place our concrete in preparation to get to our underground plumbing which we'll get to here next. So after concrete's placed and we strip forms, it will allow us to get to the next stage of our basement build, which will be standard for most basements, which is underground plumbing. So given that this is a fully functioning basement that will actually, in this case, reside half of the family members downstairs, we have two bathrooms that are located in this general vicinity where I'm standing. So this is the first bathroom. And then we have another bathroom that's located with a split floor plan down here in the basement. And so now we're gonna have underground plumbing. Now that underground plumbing is gonna travel from this corner over to our sewage sump that will be placed appropriately in our storage closet located somewhere in this region here, which will allow for appropriate slope and drainage for any of our sewage, water that's used for showering or bathing, as well as our secondary bathroom that's gonna be located out here by our outdoor patio that will also reside here with the sewage pump. And so ultimately we have another week of work for us to come in and dig appropriately for our trenches, get all of our plumbing set, um, and get our initial basin for this sewage sump in place. After which we can move forward with what is standard for any slab on grade property, which would be for us to be able to recompact dirt, ABC, and then get our termite protection in place. So termite treatment. And then after which we're able to actually place our slab. And at that point we have what almost looks like a fully functioning basement, but wait, there's a few more steps that I wanna talk about. As mentioned, for any of those of you that are even contemplating doing a basement, it's absolutely critical to think of all the steps that are gonna take to get to a point where you can actually start going vertical on the main level. So we finally placed all of our concrete that's necessary for our basement assembly. That's it, right? Well, one of the major issues that got kind of brought up in our video for those that had basements that hated them was water intrusion. And so the waterproofing and drainage step comes after these forms are stripped and it can be done in conjunction with some of the things that we're prepping inside the basement. But for all intents and purposes, this is a huge piece of the basement puzzle that needs to be thought through by both your architect, maybe your geotechnical engineer, and of course your builder. Prior to any drainage being actually put in place, we need to basically waterproof this concrete. Most people don't think of concrete as porous, but the reality is that water will travel through concrete. And we actually have to have a specialty company here in Arizona since there's not a lot of basement work. And they do more work more for retaining walls and large government projects as well as commercial projects. Um, but they also do residential work and uh, they've been a huge help for us because they're able to 100% waterproof this with a liquid membrane. Our clients decided that they wanted to be bulletproof. So instead of going with a 50 mil, they're going with a 70 mil. So it's gonna be a, a nice, thick, even coat of a waterproof epoxy membrane essentially. And then after that, we're gonna actually put a drainage mat that goes on here. And what that's gonna allow is that any water that comes up to this concrete, it's not gonna just sit on the wall. It's gonna actually drain through the drainage mat all the way down to where our actual drainage pipe will start. And it's absolutely critical to get this in place first, obviously prior to placing that drainage pipe, because after we place that drainage pipe, which we'll talk about here shortly, you'll understand why. And as mentioned, we have those conduits in place and it's for a four inch rigid pipe. Now this isn't a perf pipe, but it gives you an idea that we have a four inch rigid perf pipe that's gonna be running at least right on the top of this footing and then teeing through the wall and getting to our drainage sump that's going to allow for any water that resides in this space to be extracted and put up into our main level based on our grading and drainage to make sure that that water exits the property appropriately. So to make this detail come together, ultimately we're going to want 18 inches of drainage walk below, which brings us to about the height of our footing here. And then we're going to have our rigid perforated pipe that's going to be placed on the stem wall. We have our rigid pipe that's going to be placed on the footing with 18 inches of additional drainage rock on top. So if any water gets down into this cavity, ultimately it's gonna make its way to our drain and then it's gonna go into our sump and drain appropriately. In addition to that, we need to have a filter fabric over the top to ensure that it's wrapped kind of like a burrito so that dirt intrusion doesn't ruin that drainage over time. You know, if you had a bunch of water that was coming down and seeping down into the bottom of this basement area, you wanna make sure that it collects appropriately and that ultimately your dirt isn't gonna clog up that filter rock uh, that allows for your drainage to actually work. So now that we have our waterproofing membrane in place, 
We have our drainage assembly that allows us to be able to get any water that resides in this cavity away from the house. We'll actually be at a height about the top of this bottom panel, roughly. It's about 24 inch panel. So once the pipe goes in place, 18 inches above it, we'll be somewhere in this range. So at that point, we could just backfill and be done, right? Not quite. In this instance, we have to actually brace the interior walls prior to backfilling, or we can choose to frame and put our floor joist or our truss assembly in place prior to backfilling because we need some more structural rigidity that's either created from a bracing component or from the structural component of the framing members before just placing all that dirt and putting all that static pressure essentially on the um, overall structure that we just put in place previously. So typically there's two options, as I mentioned, you could spend time framing, which you know is a few week process to be able to get to a point where you can backfill. In this case, I think we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna brace appropriately so that we can then backfill. And then we can be able to frame the house all as one component so that we don't have to bring the framers in in two different stages and they could just really come in and nail it out of the park. So after bracing our walls and or framing the interior of the basement, we'll get to a point where we can actually get to a point where we can make the lat level at finished grade and allow us to be completed with our basement assembly. Overall, this process takes a fair amount of time. And I know that it was mentioned that some builders are just bad builders because they're not willing to actually build basements here in the Valley, although it makes perfect sense. What I will say is that the cost component of all of these steps really comes into play, which is why most basements are going to be built by custom homes that the client is asking for versus in a large scale development where there can be a lot of unforeseen and coordination pieces that quite frankly, a lot of people aren't willing to pay for. And the last thing I wanna talk about is that once we get to a final level, we have to actually do all of those stages again for our main level. Not exactly a basement, but we still have to dig for our footings, but we still have to recompact our pad as well as all of the dirt associated around the outside of this basement. So once we've properly compacted around our basement, over our additional first level pad, which is basically recompacting all the soil and getting it ready, we have to start these steps all over again. We are able to dig for our footings, place our rebar and our concrete, add our stem panels for our stem walls, pour our concrete again, plumbing underground, after which we're able to backfill, compact with AB, termite treatment and slab prior to us being able to frame our main level. And so as you can see, the basement, not only does it have more intricacies to it, but it can add a lot of time to the project to do it right and effectively the first time. And I will say that if you decide not to do it right the first time on a basement, the cost will be so detrimental in the future if should any warranty or leaks occur within that basement cavity. We appreciate you following along for this video. We hope that you found it informative and as always, have a great day.